Awesome job, man. Sign this for me. Sign that for me. I got a page full. Who got a page full? Okay, light, light, lighten this place up a little bit. So I got some questions for you, man. Really, really appreciate you doing this. Where were you before here? Before you came here? I just got back from Egypt. In Egypt. Egypt. Yeah. Did you see King Tut? No, brother. Let uh, me ask you. Let me ask you an ancient question. Oh man, that's a setup question. Go ahead. What is the difference between selling and closing? The difference between selling and closing. One gets you money, the other one doesn't. Yeah. Closing is the one that gets you the money. At the end of the day, it gets you the money. Anybody and, can sell. Yeah. You and, can close. And, and Victor, do you see them as separate arts? Like, do you see them like different than the meal and the the the, 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 the thing that comes? What's the thing after Appetizer? the meal? Appetizer. That's before the meal, man. That's right. My bad. Were you from originally? No, man. It's after the meal. The appetizer comes first, man. The dessert. The dessert. dessert. So, so. I mean, is it different? Are they different skill sets? Are they different abilities? I think they're different skill sets. And I mean, you know, I'll speak about B2B. Yeah. That's my home. Okay. And so you have to do a lot of selling just to get to the table. Do you know what I mean? I don't think you, it's almost yin and yang. You just, you it's almost like pushing on a rope, man. Mm -hmm. You can't have one without the other. And I think a lot of people try to do hard closing, but I think you know this. I don't need to preach to you about sales because we can sit here and talk all day. Buyers are smarter today. Yeah. They're into the buying cycle. They know what they want. They have all this information. They have all this access. You go in there, you try to ABC them hard. It doesn't work, especially in the B2B market. I'm specifically in the B2B market. Right. But, but do you think people actually try to hard close early? Because I don't see any of that. I don't, I don't see it. In the B2B industry, I don't see so it. So how do we know it doesn't work if nobody tries it? That's correct. I can't argue with that Because I'll tell you, there's a thing that we teach, that right? There's a thing that we do in my company. Like if you've ever seen any of my videos where, where I'm working the boiler room, you know, and, and we're selling, we're selling $100,000 products, $200,000 products. We're selling multi-million dollar contracts, exactly what he was describing here today. And, and uh, I'll walk past one of my guys. Where's my sales guys? Are they here today? <laughs> sales team! <laughs> so so I'll, be, I'll look at the timer oh, that he'd been on a minute and 20 right. seconds. And I, I ask a question. Anybody know the question? Have you seen enough to make a decision? Yep. So I don't think that that's offensive, but I know no, this, if they no. keep selling, la, 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 oh, it does this, la, 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 it does no. this, la, 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 la. I think one of, one of the things I like. Can like, you finish you know, me, you, please? You, you know your video? Yeah. The one that you closed on, on, on the phone, I think Jared was on there mm -hmm. and then you. Yeah, I took, the, it, right? I took the call over. Yeah. And so I think that's the real skill set. The real skill set is you reframe the whole conversation. You know what I mean? You reframe uh -huh. the whole conversation. And I think that's what I don't see a lot of salespeople do. Yeah. It's like they're, they're, they sell with alligator arms. You've heard that phrase, right? No, some never have. Oh. Until some right people, now. Yeah. Well, some people reach. It's like when you throw the bill on the table, everybody develops alligator arms. Nobody wants to grab the bill. In sales. You eating with the wrong people, dog. Yeah. yeah you I need to eat that. with some of my that, friends. Because they're like, hey. The I'm going to tell you, I hang out with people yeah. that are like, they want to pay first. They want to pay for it. They, they want to be the guy that pays the bill. Yeah. That's the friends you want. Right. Huh? Give an amen. Yep. Yep. You want, you want friends, John, that guy right there, you take, go to dinner with John Hamlin and I guarantee you, you will not be able to beat him except for maybe Bradley. Bradley, he, he's fast Bradley, at paying too. I hear you. I hear you. What happens is most salespeople don't want to reach for the deal. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're like, what do you think? Yeah. And I always tell people, if you end your pitch with the, what do you think? Just get out of sales. You so, know what I mean? yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about yeah. that 60% number. I like it. Okay. I never trust numbers that end with zero. Yeah. Ever. No. No, I mean, they're, they're rounded up, obviously. Okay, yeah. so, so. <laughs> well, I mean, good salespeople round numbers. I mean, if yeah, you yeah, want more yeah. credibility, give them a funky number like 57.3. Nah, oh my God, that's scientific. You know. <laughs> so, I was just trying to keep it simple. I'm man. just I'm saying, just for, to simplify for, stuff. For, for those just, of you out there that are running a business, if your treasury department or your CFO or yeah. your sales guy says, I made 100 phone calls, he is lying yeah. to you, okay? You, nobody makes 100. Right. Right, you make Just 97. One for, one for good measure on top of that. Yeah. One one. So, yeah. that's an interesting. My, qu my question was um, the 60%, right. 20% mm -hmm. buy from somebody else, yep. 40% don't buy, okay? And, right. and, and your question to the audience is why didn't they right. didn't buy? And I was telling my wife, they're uncertain. Right. Your, your yes. term for that was their asses. Right. But really, they're when you're really uncertain, you are an ass. Yeah. And if your customers are uncertain, so, and then you talk about the value thing. Yep. 
what does it mean to build value? How do I actually, like, let's say I'm selling ties, right? right? How, do I, how do the people here sit down and say, how do I figure out what value is? How do I say that? How do I add value? All right, let me add it from a B, B2B yeah. side. When you look at a price curve, look, initially, simple example. Initially, people are concerned about price right at the beginning of the deal. They're concerned about price. As they move through the process and they got to invest half a million dollars on something, it's not about price. There's other concerns. Think of the iceberg. The top, the top 10 percent you see, I'm concerned about price. Maybe you know, is this the right feature benefit? But in the background, the 90 percent underneath the water is, I got to put my name on this thing, right? If I install this software, for example, uh -huh. how does that op affect my operations? You know, now I have to retrain people. I can go on and on with a list of um, what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, and most people don't address that. They think it's all about feature, benefit, advantage, and uh -huh. price. I'm saying that most people are afraid, that part of the brain. Yeah, they're, un they're uncertain, right? They're uncertain. And they're afraid of what might happen because when we're, look, when you're going to buy half a million dollars and you're going to have to implement a new operating system, you know there are things going to go wrong. The question is, if it does go wrong, how will that impact you? And if you, the salesperson, can't make me feel good about how you're going to handle that, that's the fear part always kicking in. I think they're uncertain, but I think what drives uncertainty is also fear. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I guess they can go hand in hand, but it's, well, it's fear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and you talked about the 6.8, mm -hmm. that the average B2B sale takes, well, how long did you say? Almost seven people to actually sign off on the deal. Yeah, so these are influencers, vice president, CEO, yeah. maybe a sales manager, the implementer. So you're saying each one of these really require a different value add Absolutely. proposition. Absolutely. The, the chief operating officer is going to worry about the impact of operations and production. The chief technical officer is wor worried about whether I can implement it, is it upgradable, is it expandable, can I do something with it, right? The, the CEO is worried about how will this expand my market share, right? Purchasing the economic buyer is worried about could I get it cheaper or can I get it somewhere else? Yeah. Four different buying reasons and motives. So, so how do they sit down? What's the exercise mm -hmm. that I sit down with a glass board or a black board or a white board? Is that cool board or yeah, what? That is a cool board, man. And That's the first time I use that type of board. Right? So it's, it's, it's all glass, baby. Yeah, it is, man. Okay. Now, I could have got a cheaper board. I love it, man. Look okay. at that. It's, it's awesome. Okay. I could have got a cheaper board. Especially the red rims. The red rims, right? Got some red rims. They're like, they're like 10x red rims, man. I just got tired of the ones that you were racing, and, and then one day it, do, it doesn't come off. You know, so, you. like, let's get a glass board. That's nice, so, how do how do I sit down? Whether my client's buying a ten dollar product, right, or a ten million dollar product, start building the story for those six point eight influencers. Let's say that. Let's go with the six influencers, right? Well, let's go with easier. There's a management buyer. There's a user buyer. There's typically a technical buyer. Then there's an economic buyer. So let's just say four buyers, right? By the way, the acronym MUTE helps me remember it. The management buyer is usually the executive. What is he worried about? Is this the right product? Is it gonna help me capture more market share? So that's his why buy. But what is he afraid of? Maybe this isn't the right product. Maybe I should wait and leapfrog with a different technology. The user buyer is the person that's actually gonna use whatever software equipment you're gonna put in place, and they're gonna give their opinion. The technical buyer, again, is thinking about the technical aspects, and then the economic buyer. If I put all those four in a grid and figure out why they would buy, but more importantly, Grant, I add why they wouldn't buy. Mm -hmm. What would hold them back from buying? And if I list all that out, now I gear back my presentation, I look at it, and then I address those. And I know we come from the same school of philosophy. We don't let them raise the objection. We tell them, look, you're going to experience some problems. We're going right, to raise right. the objection because right, we control right. the conversation. So right. you, know, you, you understand what he's saying? Don't wait for them to bring up the objection. Especially raise if you know it. it's there. If you know the, look, if you look, if you do some, I talk to your other salespeople, people who've been around in the business, you know what the objections are. But some salespeople, sissy salespeople, I go, I hope he doesn't bring it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they yeah. like, oh, and then they, you end the meeting, you didn't get the deal, and then you're thinking, well, maybe, you know, they won't bring it up. And they're going to bring it up. The problem is you're not going to be around to address the issue. Mm -hmm. And so there's this curve called the Ebbinghaus curve, which I think is very fascinating, that said within 24 hours, you will forget 75% of what I told you. So yeah. now think about this in a customer situation. You walk out of it, he says, I'll think about it. Within 24 hours, he's forgotten 75. Within 30 days, they forget like 90%. The 10% they're able to recall, 50% is that incorrect. What does that mean? He forgot he was going to think about it. Yeah, even that. Yeah. So they don't. They don't. How, how do I pick, how do, if maybe for some people out here today that, that are, how many of you are in sales? 
How do people find the right thing or industry to sell? How do they find it? How do, how do you I, pick? Like if you were brand new, you're going out there and you're going to sell a product. I mean, the, the pat answer is you find something you like, but I fell into accidentally. Yeah. I fell in love with telecommunications and I like technology. I came from that side. And so I just like, you know, things that go blink. You know what I mean? I hate to say it though. I love technology, so I'd rather play in that space. You know, if you like music, for example, I mean, you can sell a lot of equipment, a lot of software out there. So I would start with something you just enjoy. If you can't be a what, musician, what, what, sell what, the software. What, but what if that thing's dying? What, what if you're in a space where, because there, there's clearly some stuff that's dying. Yeah. You love it. The artist loves their art, but they never sell anything because they, they, they never offer the donkey yeah. two stacks of hay. Yeah. Well, Tell me what you think of this approach. Yeah. Again, I'm asking for yeah, yeah. Your, your, your point of view. It'd be interesting. When people say, Victor, should I love what I sell? I always say no. And here's why. I said, you should like what you sell, but you should love what it does for your customer. Mm -hmm. no, Do I you love know that. what I mean? I love that. Because love that. you're not focused. See, when you say, I love my product, well, you're being egoistic. But if I'm selling a product or service, I'm selling the Grant Cardone sales training program. I like the program, but I love mm -hmm. what it does for my customer. That should jack you up. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That should jack you up. What if it doesn't make them any money, though? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. What if it doesn't make them any money? Find something that makes you money. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, give them a big hand, huh? Thank you, guys. Big hand. Thank you, guys. The thing. Thank you, Thank you, Thank, Thank, you, you, Thank you, man. Thank, Thank you. you. Big hand. opportunity and it's your number one biggest advantage. But this whole theory of needing money to make money is just bullshit. How many times did you think about quitting, JJ, o over your career? I don't know how I know how many times you've answered that honestly. I mean, how often do you, I, I think about quitting all the time. It's just like, uh, you're talking about what you've done with your wife. I mean, you've got to constantly keep putting there. There isn't like, for you got to keep water and fertilizing in that thing. And Within a year of graduating from college, I made over a million dollars online. Not because I was smart, but because I found smart people and I modeled them. Is there a mistake that has been done to you? Let's use the 10X principles and play through that mistake just to have a chance. It's always a yes until it's a no. And if it's a no, you make it a yes and you try again. Rather than you taking a list of 50 people and just smiling and dialing, it doesn't make any sense. This is all about how to 10X your income by building a celebrity personal brand. But the ability to actually win, to find the opponent's weakness, and to attack it, and to go after it, and continue to go after it. Find their weakness, you go after it. You want me to dig a ditch? I'm digging a ditch. You're gonna pay for my manicure after, but I'm digging a ditch. Whatever that man needs, whatever you need, whatever I can do to support him, to help you, I'm freaking doing it. You need to have an opinion. You are in the business to persuade other human beings. Cash is king, and you need to learn how to where, where is your cash coming from, who owes it to you, when is it due. Not you need to do the best you can. If you've got a business partner, partner that thinks this way, you think the other way, what are your people gonna do? I want more, I'm not gonna lie to you. I want more, I want it right now today. All of you, even if you're doing a billion dollars, you need to take a chance. Hold and say, this I have done. You are here because you have an uncommon desire to live a bigger life and to live your dream. But if you cannot tie your feature, your benefit, your gain, your advantage to increasing revenue, reducing costs, expanding market share, people simply what? Shut down. You look them dead in the eye and say, I, I, no, I didn't hear you. I, I am going to wipe you out. That's how you do it. Become the star in your field. Figure out what it is, and this is an amazing thing that I learned from Grant, what it is that others are not doing, and do it. There's a tribe of us. A tribe of world shakers. A tribe of history makers. A tribe of people who do not want to get stuck in an almost life. Why don't somebody clap your hands and shout if you're ready to take this thing to...
Gary had this conversation with me about, oh, the girl's better off working for herself at 40 grand a year than she is working for somebody else at 40 grand a year. The internet's so beautiful. I said, dude, ain't nobody better off working for 40 grand. A <laughs> Great answer. Okay. Great Your business answer. is too small, bro. You gotta, you gotta figure out how to get, you should be completely focused on raising $200 million and drop the 250 a month. We change our strategy to market to somebody every day. We've changed our strategy today just to put on the event multiple times throughout the day because we're nimble, because we're always trying to hit the target. And we push, and we insist, and we inspect that the target gets hit. Yeah, you, got, you, guys, you, got, you guys all worry about all the stuff you do that you don't feel good about. You need to worry about the stuff you don't do that you should have done. Everything that I have today, all the success I have has happened in the last seven to eight, nine years.